He says, the former Tredis have I made, O Theophilus. That word Theophilus, it's a person's name, but it also means lover of God. Okay? So he's talking to you too, if you're a lover of God. Concerning all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Notice he began, it never says he stopped. Until the day when he was taken up, until after he had given commandments through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he presented himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, appearing to them for 40 days and speaking concerning the establishment of a new religion. And then what it says is, it says concerning the kingdom of God. <clears throat> he says, being assembled with them, he commanded them, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, of which you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, now here's the point I want to get to, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And notice this terminology. They were still concerned about their national pride. Are you going to bring us out of Roman rule? Are you going to overthrow the Romans? When are you going to establish the kingdom? When is Israel going to be great again? Because you could even go back and say, hey, God promised Abraham we'd be a great nation. And they would have been accurate. But they were too small-minded. Because notice what they said. They said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So obviously the answer is no. Why? Because he was trying to restore the kingdom to the world. He wasn't trying to just restore it to Israel. Israel was the people through whom it would come because that's who the Messiah would come through. But notice, they were saying, are you going to help us? Are you going to restore us? Jesus was saying, uh, for God so loved the world. He was trying to bring the kingdom to the world. He wants all men to be under the governance of the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Now, he goes on. <clears throat> now watch this. He, his answer. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you shall receive power, that word dunamis, as we echo here all the time. That means supernatural ability, the same type and force that God himself has. He says, but you shall receive that power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, at that point, notice that they were trying to say, are you going to restore the kingdom? He had just spent three and a half, almost four years of trying to get people to understand what the kingdom was, but even the prophets, especially Isaiah and some of the others, even prophesied ahead of time and said, these people, they have closed their eyes. They have shut their ears. He didn't say God did it to them. He said they didn't want what God was bringing. It's pretty amazing. We want to go to God and get from God what we want, not what he wants us to have. Too often, I, I'd say we do that. Not everybody, of course, but I'm saying too often. And one of the biggest problems in the church is that the church has become just a seeker-friendly, consumer-oriented organization where people come in and say, here's what I need. And it doesn't say that. He tells us that we are here for him. Now, is he here for us? Not just for us, but he's here to help us. He's here to bless us. He's here to give us what we need when we need it. Of course, all that's true. But the reason he's there for that is because we are to be here for him. It's amazing to me, you know, many times whenever you move around in charismatic circles, people have forgotten the fact that their sins were forgiven, that they were cleansed and made clean before God. And they, they get hung up on the gifts. They get hung up on the blessings. They get hung up on healing or anything else rather than realizing first and foremost, it, for, first and foremost, I should say, <clears throat> that the main reason Jesus came was to cleanse us from our sins because if he couldn't do that, then all the other stuff wouldn't matter. 
Because what does it profit a man to get everything else and his soul still go to hell? But too often we look just at the <clears throat> blessing part of God. But here, now you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. We're only going a couple of places today <clears throat> during this time anyway. The word the kingdom, or yeah, the term the kingdom, is actually used 122 times in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, it says, and this is the first time, <coughs> actually, uh, well, there's a couple of things we could read here. Let's, you know what? Let's go there real quick. Matthew chapter 3, because I'm also going to take you to uh, Luke here in just a minute. <coughs> but in Matthew 3, and I want to look at verse 2. Yeah. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice John the Baptist was preaching the kingdom of heaven before Jesus did. Okay, So this was a move about the kingdom. It wasn't, uh, please understand, I'm going to say a lot of things that doesn't fit with some religious idea. But Jesus didn't come to start a religion. He came to restore and to establish the kingdom. Okay? <clears throat> but here, it you have to understand, it wasn't just about Jesus. Jesus has the preeminence, but Jesus had a mission, and he came with that mission. Just recently, I had a, uh, actually, I was going through some, uh, the, uh, some of our manuals, and in it, I had written down that God doesn't care if you have a doctrine, just as long as you don't have a mission to go along with it. Well, he didn't care what doctrine, and I understand, he, now, I, I'm, I'm telling you, the, the devil want you to have a doctrine. He doesn't even care if your doctrine is accurate. Right? Matter of fact, he would love for your doctrine to be accurate as long as you don't have a mission. Because if you're not going to live the doctrine, then you're just a bad example. You're just a, a billboard for the devil <clears throat> that God can't keep his word. And it's not God not keeping his word. It's us that's not keeping his word. And so he doesn't care if you have a doctrine. He doesn't even care what that doctrine is as long as you don't have a mission to go along with it. But once you get a mission to go along with the doctrine, then you start hitting resistance. Then you start seeing how the enemy doesn't want you to live that out. So the, the, one of the, the, as I said in the beginning, the problem in the church is that we have become a seeker-friendly, self-help, motivational, consumer-driven organization. Why? Because you want market share. You want to get as many people as you can. Why? You got to get them, you know, rears in the seats. Now, I can tell you that ain't here. Amen? I'd rather have five people that want to do something than 5,000 that just want to come hear me preach. Because I could care less about whether people like what I say or not. I'd rather work with people that want to get something done. That's not just anything done, but God's will done. Amen? So, here, <clears throat> this is the first time it talks about preaching the kingdom, and it's John the Baptist. Now, the next time we see it, okay, you can find it over in Matthew chapter 4. Let's see if I can find it real quick here. Yep, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From that time, he started preaching the kingdom, and he never stopped. Even after he was raised from the dead with the disciples for 40 days, all he talked about was the kingdom. From start to finish, the kingdom. Everything he said was about the kingdom. Every parable was about the kingdom. I know I've already said this. I'm just repeating it. Because everything had to do with the kingdom. And yet, I can guarantee you, I'm not going to do it here. I actually, if I was where I should be right now, I'd be saying this to a different group of people. And I can honestly tell you that based on my experience of where I have been, I can guarantee you and say without any hesitation, a, an extremely small number, if any, are seeking first the kingdom. They are seeking first their healing. 
That's why they come here me. They want me to lay hands on. They don't come to hear me preach, generally. They come to get me to lay hands on. Most of them are waiting for me to shut up just so I can, they can get to me and I can lay hands on them. That's the way people think. They're not thinking kingdom. They're not thinking, I'm here. God, what do you want from me? What can I do for you? They don't think that. Why? Because we've lost a sense of gratitude toward God. Now we got a sense of entitlement. Well, your word said that I can be healed. So where is it? I, I get those kind of texts all the time. from People say, well, I, I believe God's word. How come we're not well? Okay, you just told me you believe God's word, and then you told me you don't believe God's word. Because he never said he was going to heal you. He said he already has. And we won't believe that. When you believe that, you get healed, and nobody has to lay hands on you. So he says here in verse 17, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When it says it's at hand, that's an old English term. It means it has arrived. It's here. Now, the thing with Jesus was the kingdom of God was within him. He brought it with him. Everywhere he went, he demonstrated the kingdom that was within him. And the amazing thing is the kingdom was in him and he was in the kingdom. You get that? This isn't some weird, wispy, oh, inside and, you know, the Father's in him and now I'm in the Father and the Father's in me and I'm in Jesus. And, and people are, oh, that's so mystical. No, it's not mystical like that at all. It's the same way that you're in the kingdom and the kingdom is in you. Because let me tell you, if the kingdom isn't in you, you're not in the kingdom. So if you're not living by the laws, if you're not living by the principles, by the keys or whatever you want to call them, if you're not living by those principles of the kingdom, then the kingdom's not in you. Because when you live by the principles, the kingdom is in you. And when you don't live by the principles... The kingdom isn't in you, and that means you're not in the kingdom. Good morning. Isn't it simple? It's, it's, it's simple? We don't like it, but it's simple. And the thing is, the sad part is, if we would just do what it said, our lives would be so dramatically different. Dramatically different. Look at Jesus' life. You know, it doesn't say one time he ever went to anybody and had hands laid on him. He didn't have to have help. I, I don't know why. I, I can't explain it. I really can't. Of why certain things jump in my face. And one of the things that's been jumping in my face, or I should say in my ears, I guess. I don't know, because I, I hear it. And, well, I read it, too, from texts and, and people write me. I, I've got people. I, I want to thank everybody. All, all these people praying for me. I thank you. Keep praying. Because it ain't done. All these people are praying as if, oh, if we just get one more, that'll tip the scale. And the, you tell me you got a thousand people praying for you, and I say you got a thousand people wasting their time because none of them's praying in faith. Because if one prays in faith, it'll be done. If two can agree, it's absolutely done. But it doesn't mean that you got to keep adding more and more numbers. Or well, let's gather all the churches together. If we can do that, we can have revival here. Oh, no, it just takes one person serious to decide, bless God, my town's going to have revival. My town's going to turn to Jesus. And you know what? It ain't just praying. Then that means you've got to put some feet to your faith, and you've got to go out and knock on doors and put the gospel in people's face and let them know, you know what? God loves you so much he sent me here. And he said, and you could even tell him, if God wasn't in me, I wouldn't care about you. It's just God in me that makes me care about you, which is why I'm here. And you can actually share the gospel with them. But for some reason, people think that the Spirit's just going to carry the gospel out there. And just because you're praying here, that you're gonna, that the Spirit's going to move out there. That's not the way it works. You pray in here, and the Spirit moves you out there. Amen? We've got to realize we're not here. Listen, your job is not why you're here. Your job isn't why you exist. Your career, I don't care what career you've got. I don't care what degree you've got or whatever else. None of that matters in the scheme of things. Not one, of, not one bit of it matters. And that's where a lot of people have their pride. Well, this I got a degree and this is my job and this is my career. And look at this. And it means status. And all, all that should mean is this is how God pays you so you can represent the kingdom. 
That's what it should be. Now, in Matthew chapter 4, again, starting in verse 17, we just read it, I'm going to read it again. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, change your mind, turn around. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Hey, can you imagine that? Some guy walks up to you. You're at your job. Some guy walks up and looks at you and says, okay, Hey, I see you fishing. For fish. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And then he turns and walks off and they're like, let's go. And walk away from their job. Walk away. No two weeks notice. And that was a family job. It's harder to walk away from a family business. Why? Because it's family. But they, they immediately left and walked away. What was it? that would make somebody walk away from their job that they'd had all their life. Their only source of income. Believe me, if they didn't fish that day, they probably didn't eat that night. And they sure couldn't sell it if they didn't catch it. This was huge when they walked away. But Jesus told a parable at one point about this pearl of great price. And it's funny because it's amazing what religion does. Religion takes everything Jesus said and makes it about something else. Because Jesus, now understand, Jesus has preeminence in all things. But he did not say that he was the pearl of great price. He said the kingdom is. Is that right? Jesus, you know, one of the, one of the things, one of many Okay, that makes him so amazing and so great is that if he had not done what he did, we couldn't even get in the kingdom. But he provided it. That's the other thing. You know, I've actually taught this before, but I know a lot of times we have new people and people hadn't heard different things. But listen, the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus preached is not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't preach that. He hid that. He didn't walk around and tell me, hey, listen, let me preach the gospel of the kingdom to you. I'm going to die, and then on the third day, I'm going to raise again from the dead, and then I'm going to go, I'm going to write. Matter of fact, if you're there, when I leave, you're going to watch me just rise up into heaven. He didn't preach any of that. He didn't say any of that stuff. He hid it. And so, but it, what he did preach was, here's what the kingdom is like. Here's what it's like to live in the kingdom. Here's what it's like to demonstrate the kingdom. That's what he told him to do. He said, you go and preach the gospel. What gospel? The gospel of the kingdom. He didn't say, go preach me. They didn't go preach him. You hear that? You don't hear that term that they preach Christ really until the book of Acts. And that was for the purpose of what he did that lets us into the kingdom. The gospel of Jesus Christ, now understand, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not the same as the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, is yes, that he came, he lived, he died, he carried our sins, he carried our sicknesses from us, and he was buried, and then he rose again the third day, and then he ascended into heaven. And then he sent back his spirit to us so that we could do the exact same things he did. Why? Because now we're in the kingdom. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is his life, death, burial, resurrection, essentially. But the gospel of the kingdom is the good news that the kingdom of God is available. And the Bible is very clear. It says, and all men, violent men, press into it. And think about that. It's two, two big different things that we're talking about. The gospel of Jesus Christ is what he did that gives us entry into the kingdom. But the good news of the kingdom is, guess what? It's not just for Israel. It's for anybody that wants in it. As long as you don't shut your ears and close your eyes. And he said, because if you'll open your ears and open your eyes, he said, then you'll be converted 
And then he even said, and I should heal them. Think about that. Here God is offering this amazing opportunity to step into the kingdom. And we're looking at him like we're saying, oh, God, well, thank you so much. But no, I don't want to see that. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. Thank you, though. I appreciate it. But I, I just don't. Wanna... Why? Because we shut our own eyes and ears to it. And you know what we look at instead? Oh, no, no. That, no, I, I just I don't get that. Uh, let's look at religion. Why? Because I know I can do religion. I'll never be good enough because religion never makes you good enough. Religion always tells you you're not good enough. You'll never attain. You'll never, you know, get good enough. But you'll keep trying. But the kingdom says, I did it for you. Now step in and live this life. Meaning he set us free. You know, really, here in America, most people know the quote, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Notice it says pursuit. Doesn't ever say you'll get it. Right? Just something to think about, right? But the motto of the kingdom could easily be life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness. Now, the beauty of that is he makes us holy, and then he tells us now live holy. That's our part, right? Now, he goes on, he says here, and they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Man, Jesus is, you talk about a recruiter. I mean, I mean, think about this. The, the, the employment rate of this area, well, the unemployment rate raised drastically when Jesus showed up, everybody's quitting their jobs because they found a new job. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That's what he preached. And healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. What was he doing? He was demonstrating the gospel he preached. And his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers or various diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. Notice the long list they gave of all the people, and then they finished it. He healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. Now look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. I'm just going to give you some scriptures. You know these. This is Jesus giving the Sermon of the Beatitudes, as people would call it. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice the only thing he ever promised them in this whole blessed are they series that he spoke was the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So you can see, kingdom stands out pretty prevalent. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So apparently, uh, your stature, status, reputation in the kingdom is more important than anything else. Because Jesus kept bringing that up. 
For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, if the kingdom of heaven wasn't a big deal, people would have said, so? So what? I don't get to go into the kingdom of heaven. Big deal. But apparently this was the prize. So, and you'll notice too, this is just something else that's kind of a by the way. Because I taught a lot of these things similar uh, before, and it's on in the book, uh, Behold the Kingdom. And in that, and we've actually taught along some other lines, there are actually 85 different contrasts in the kingdom and in the new covenant, so to speak. And in these in the kingdom, talking about the kingdom, it's pretty amazing because the kingdom of heaven is only mentioned in Matthew. It's never mentioned in any of the other gospels. The other gospels, a lot of it overlaps, but in the other gospels, it's called the kingdom of God. And then the kingdom of God is also, I believe, mentioned in, in Matthew also. But there's a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is more earth realm based and the kingdom of heaven is a matter of profession. In other words, you profess Christ here, and you're considered in the kingdom of heaven. But that doesn't mean you're actually in the kingdom of God. Why? Because it says the kingdom of heaven will be taken away. It never says that about the kingdom of God. So, matter of fact, he even said that Abraham and others would be coming together in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom would be cast out into outer darkness. So you can be in the kingdom of heaven and lose it. But if you're in the kingdom of God, you don't come out of that one. So there's a difference between professing and possessing. Now, I don't know if you ever heard that before, but it's the Bible. You can search it out, get a hold of uh, the, the, the book we got in there and go through it. Search it. Don't take my word for it. Search it out. I had to search it out. Only what you search out and prove for yourself actually becomes yours. That's what you understand. You don't understand it until you prove it to yourself and you've searched it for yourself. And the problem is, if you don't understand, the Bible is clear that whenever someone hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the devil, the thief, comes immediately to steal the word which was sown in your heart. So now notice, it was sown in your heart, but you didn't understand it. And because of that, the devil could steal it. And if he can steal it, what does he come to do? To steal, kill, and destroy. How does he do that? If he can steal the word, he can kill you and destroy you. So all of this goes back to the kingdom. Everything we do should be about the kingdom. Right? And to advance the kingdom while we're here. We are not here to get to heaven. Do you get that? We're not on this earth with the goal of getting to heaven. That, that's never presented as a goal. It, the goal is to get into the kingdom of heaven, to get into the kingdom of God, but not to get to heaven. See, why would God tell us, pray, thy kingdom come on earth, let thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Why would he tell us to do that here if his goal was to get us to heaven? I mean, if you think about it, best thing you could do if your goal is just to get to heaven is just have somebody stand there with a gun. Just have them stand there waiting. Listen, I'm fixing to make Jesus Lord. As soon as I do, just go ahead and kill me. Because I, I can't wait to get to heaven. Uh, that's where I'm going. That's my purpose. If that's the purpose of God, why does he leave you here? When you get born again, why didn't he do you like he did Elijah? There he goes. Can you imagine that? It's like mentioning Jesus and making Jesus Lord of their life, and you get to watch them just whoop, right on up right then. Might be more people doing it. I don't know. You know, hey, I want that. Yeah. Of course, I don't know who would be here to preach you, preach at you, because they would have already been gone. So, so if you're left here, it must be so you can preach. You're getting real quiet. <laughs> so. Now, go with me to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 9. It says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, holy be thy name. Notice what he says. Our Father 
which art in heaven. Our Father, which is not here. Our Father, which is there. You get that? Holy, hallowed, sanctified, set apart, sacred, be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Notice when God's kingdom comes, his will is done. When his will is done, his kingdom has come. You understand that? Wherever his will is done, his kingdom is there. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, I want to notice there, there I was reading out of King James, of course. I want to go back and I want to read it to you again from the modern English version. And he says, and notice, give us this day our daily bread. Start in verse 11. And forgive us our debts. We forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. Why does he tell us? De, de, notice he says, and lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. Why, why would he tell us to pray that? Because you have to remember, the principles or the laws of prayer apply all the way through prayer. The law, one of the main laws of prayer is that when you pray, believe you have received. Is that right? That's, that is the primary principle that makes a prayer into a prayer of faith. Right? So if you don't believe that you receive when you pray, you have not prayed a prayer of faith, which is the only prayer God guarantees to answer. Right? So why did he say, why, why would it be important that he would say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil? Why? Because we're, we are, when we pray that, we have to believe that we have received that, meaning God is not the one that leads us into temptation. Isn't that right? But he is the one that delivers us. And we have to believe that he has, if we're moving into an area of temptation, it ain't God taking us there. And number two, that he will deliver us from evil. So we have received that deliverance even before the problem happens. If I was going to send one of my children to the store, I'm not going to tell them to go to the store and then say, uh, find out how much it is, and then come back and get the money. I'm going to send the money with them. I'm going to give them money before they leave the house. To do what? To take care of whatever the need is I'm sending them to the store for. Does this make sense? So the answer has to be given before the problem arises. So how do you answer the problem before it arises? How do you get the answer before it arises? You believe the word of God. When you pray, you believe that you receive. If you just took that little piece right there, it'd change your life. The, the sad part of what I see among Christi in, in Christianity is that to a large degree, if not totally, Karl Marx was accurate when he said religion is the opiate of the masses. He didn't say it about the kingdom. He said about religion. God would agree with him. Why? Because that's what religion does. Religion acts as an opiate. It dulls the senses. It moves you into a lethargy and into just a, an attitude of what matters. Nothing. That's what religion does. But we have to realize we're not here for religion. We're here for kingdom. So, he says here, now watch this, I'm going to read pretty much straight on through. Yep. He says, for if you forgive men for their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men for their sins, neither will your Father forgive your sins. Pretty simple. Now, see, here's the, here's the key. You, when you read the Bible, remember who's saying it, who it's being said to, and when is it being said. Is it before the cross? After the cross, before your new birth, or after your new birth? Does this make sense? Because you have to look at the things that he said. There are things he told us to seek. And he says, and if you seek, you will find. 
So it's not a matter of us always seeking. There has to be a point where we actually find. Most Christians, based on their own wording, their own actions, how they, their own emotions, let's put it that way, they never find. They're always seeking. This is one of the things that kind of got me in trouble when I was up in Chalice, Idaho years and years ago. Uh, me and David Hogan, and then there were some other people there preaching. And I said some of these statements. And wow, <laughs> it caused an uproar. And it was, uh, well, let's put it this way. I ain't never been invited back. <laughs> okay, that's okay, though. I got still got a lot of other places in the world to go. Right? But people don't like it. Whenever you tell them what they're doing is wasting time and not accomplishing something. That's why one of the things that bugs me about Christians is that most times what we call worship isn't even worship. It's manipulation to try to get something from God. And if you're trying to get something from God, if that's your purpose in doing something, that's not worship. Worship is because of who God is, what he is, and that you exalt him simply because of that, regardless of what he does for you. Amen. Praise has to do with what he has done for you. But worship is only about his character and nature and his totally separate majesty. And you recognize that and you worship him for that. And just like Charles Finney said, I would worship him even he said, I would worship him for the rest of my life, even if he told me that at the end of my life, he had to put me in hell for the kingdom's sake. He said, I would still worship him. Why? Because me going to hell does not change his characteristics. He is still worthy of all praise. You see, most people look at, well, I want Jehovah Rapha, the healer. If he doesn't heal me, then I'm done with it. Better hope God never says that to you. See, we have to realize we're not the important ones. He's important. Amen? So he goes on. Now watch. He says, moreover, when you fast, not if, when, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces so they may appear to men to be fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. Now, you know the sad part about most people that fast? You know it. Because they want to talk about it. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you will not appear to men to be fasting but to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You know, what's amazing. Well, I might as well finish where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in nor steal. Okay, and before I finish that, what is amazing to me is the thieves don't even have to break in anymore to steal. Isn't that right? All you got to do is look at where the dollar is. Has the dollar gone up or gone down? You say, if it's gone down, they stole. Somebody stole from you and you didn't even know it till you checked it out and they didn't even have to come into your house. They didn't even walk into the bank. They just adjusted some numbers on a computer. Isn't that amazing? And yet people, that becomes their life. How much can I gather? And then it becomes the goal of the thieves of, yeah, gather as much as you can. Why? Because when I go to take it, it'll be that much easier. Now, <laughs> well, used to, you didn't know who was a thief. And now we know who they are. We try to put them all in one place. Call Washington. 
So, <laughs> and we have what's called a representative government, right? It's amazing because <laughs> the, the very reason for the Boston Tea Party was taxation without representation. And when they tell you they represent you and they don't, it's still taxation without representation. Amen? So, anyway. He says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unclear... Your whole body will be full of darkness. Therefore, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, there's a whole lot there, and I don't have time to get it all out today, but I'm trying to get to a particular point, and I've already gone too long. But I'm trying to get down there real quick. We'll jump on down. Well, yeah, right there. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. We can say God money, God and things, whatever. Therefore, I say to you, take no thought about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they do not sow, nor do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Who among you, by taking thought, can add a cubit? That's about a half of a meter. It's about a year. Uh, foot and a half, roughly 18 inches, <clears throat> to his stature. Why take thought about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither work nor they spin. And I, I see, even as I talk this, I know I'm not saying nothing about you, but we've heard this so much that we just run through it. We don't really stop and think about it. But he said, take, he said, listen, don't, don't think about these things. Matter of fact, he goes on and tells us, I'm going to jump ahead. Uh, over into verse 30. Therefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is here and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. What's he saying? The heathen, the pagans, people without a God, things like that. You have a God. Why would you worry about these things? You have a God that, want, that will take care of you. He knows what you have need of. You have a heavenly Father who knows what you have need of before you even ask. And yet we spend so much time wringing our hands saying, how am I going to pay this bill? How am I going to pay that bill? How, and then especially now, everything you hear is kind of, how are we going to put food on the table? Take no thought. You have a Father who will take care of you. Why? Well, that just sounds like your head's in the clouds. Head, feet, all of it. It's all in the kingdom of heaven. 100%. Amen? Listen, I'm not in denial, okay? I'm not ignoring things. I'm not over here, you know, as they would say in La La Land over there. That's, that's not it. I, I'm, I'm believing the word of God. And he said he would take care of us. He has proven this over and over and over. It might not be always exactly the way you think it should be or has to be. Because I can tell you, God did not send Jesus to the cross so you can be rich. So that you can heap up, so that you can store up treasure on earth. He did it so you can have the ability to store up treasure in heaven. Now that does not mean that you're supposed to be broken, poor, and hurt, and destitute, and all that kind of stuff here. There may be times in preaching the gospel that you need to go through some things. Not that you need to go through it because God wants you to go through it, but you go through it because you have decided you're going to go somewhere and times can get rough when you go there. Does that make sense? But you're not going to be able to help people if you're broke too. So I'm not saying you should be broke. Listen, I'm, I'm not in either ditch. I'm right in the middle of the road where we're supposed to be. You understand that? You're supposed to have enough to be able to bless other people, take care of your own family. If you don't take care of your family, you're worse than an infidel. So you got to be able to take care of your family, but you also ought to have that to give to other people that need help too. Right? Well, guess what? That means you couldn't be broke or you're not going to be able to help other people. Is this making sense? 
but you're also not supposed to be sitting on a pile of money while people around you are starving. Now listen, I'm not a communist. You understand? And I don't believe anybody has the right to come take what's yours and give it to somebody else. I, I believe you have the right to give to others. Whatever God has blessed you with, however he's done it, that's up to you. Amen? So, I just want to get to this last part. He says, for your heavenly father, he said, don't be like the Gentiles, don't be like the heathen. For your heavenly father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek first, seek first, put the kingdom first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right standing in his kingdom, right standing with him. And all these things, things shall be given to you. God doesn't mind you having things. As we've always said, he minds the fact whenever things have you. Therefore, take no thought about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take thought about the things of itself. Sufficient to the day is the trouble thereof. Now, we could go on and on. But I want you to realize what well, we've got to focus on the kingdom. We've got to focus on why we're here. Advancing the kingdom means witnessing to the lost. Advancing the kingdom means feeding the hungry. Advancing the kingdom means helping clothe people that don't have proper clothing. Okay? Now, let's just take that one step further. If you're going to help clothe the people that don't have proper clothing, one of the best ways to make sure they're saved. Why? Because it's amazing when people get saved, how much more clothing they put on their body. It's really amazing. Right? When you can look out into a church congregation and see almost as much skin as you could at a nightclub, there's an issue, right? Now, I'm not saying we ought to go around and, you know, as they say, be those clothesline preachers where all you do is talk about clothing, that kind of stuff. But let me tell you, whenever God gets a hold of your heart, your clothing will change. If your clothing hadn't changed, God hadn't got a hold of your heart. Just that simple, right? There is a modesty that comes with holiness. Amen? Well, I'm not as bad as the people in the clubs. Uh, maybe not today, but back in the day, if you most Christians wore what they wear now back in the day, they would have been considered a streetwalker. I'm talking about women, men too. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. I can tell you stories. <laughs> because there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of modesty in the church anymore. Which simply means... God isn't really getting a hold of people's hearts. Which means people are coming for what they can get, not for who they can be. Amen? Does this make sense? So, i got to stop here, but we'll be back shortly. And uh, there are two things that you need to remember, two filters to put your life through. One is the kingdom of God. The other is the new creation. Those two things. You have to look at everything through a new creation through the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God takes care of everything else. Uh, maybe I get a chance to share on some of these things. Uh, but anyway, I got to stop there. So, did y'all get anything out of this this morning? Seek first the kingdom of God. Amen? We're, we're not here to just live a life and get to heaven someday. We're here for a reason. We're here for a purpose, and that is to advance the kingdom. Not... 30 minutes out of a week. But this is to be our driving, consuming passion. Is to be in the kingdom, to demonstrate the kingdom, to expand the kingdom. That's it. Amen? All right, we'll stop there. Y'all get up, get around, meet each other, and we'll be back shortly.